I'm a parent uh, of a Philadelphia public school student. Uh, she's in high school, and as you know, Philadelphia is sort of a, a crucible for ed reform for the past 15 years or so. Um, we've had we've had our uh, four uh, broad superintendents. We've been taken over uh, state takeover. We do not have an elected school board for over a dozen years. Um, in 2013, they closed 23 of our schools, laid off 3,000 teachers, and then later that summer decided to roll out a whole school report card grading system that was underwritten by the Dell Foundation. And at that point, like I'd always been involved in, in my daughter's schooling, but I stood up and I said, you know, this this isn't right. You've created this, you know, all of this instability, and now you're going to be grading our schools and comparing them against charters that don't have these, um, the tests don't count, they're like a year behind us, and this is all being funded through the Delk Foundation, and this, this is a problem. So I, I, at that point, I thought the answer was to um, withhold data from the high stakes tests so that they wouldn't have this ammunition to close our schools and, and fire our teachers. Um, so I did that for a number of years. I was a Pennsylvania uh, contact, one of them for United Opt Out, and sort of I worked that for, for a while, and then I got to the point, um, that we were, I was pushing opt out, and our um, school district started being very accommodating to our opt out needs. And I would say, yes, well, it's a, Pennsylvania has a state law that says that you can opt out on religious grounds. And I'm saying, you know, we have this law, and you need to provide the letter that the state says, and you need to translate it, and you need to pay for the photocopies. And they were like, sure. And at that point, I started thinking, what's wrong with this picture? And I turned it over and over in my head, like what is their benefit if we all start opting out? Like this is very inconsistent with their normal pattern of behavior. And um, so at that time it was leading into the ESSA, was, was coming, coming down the pike and I, I came across um, Emily Talmadge's blog and if you're not aware, um, she's a, a school teacher in Maine. She, her, her blog is Saving Maine Schools and sort of connected with that and fell a little bit down the rabbit hole. And my background is I, I so I work half time. I have a high school age daughter who's pretty self sufficient. Um, I'm in a district where it's very easy to see the end game of how where things are ultimately could lead. If I were in a, a better supported district, it might be harder to imagine a day without school buildings and teachers. But I can go there mentally, and I where I work, I work for a small cultural institution that I could very much imagine one day being part of this learning ecosystem model that I'm talking about. So I, I have this sort of background and the time and inclination. I don't have specific background in this. I don't know that you can get a degree in studying this, but I pull the thread and I, I have the time to follow the money. And really, once you learn the language of this new phase of ed reform and you understand the players and you're willing to keep clicking the next web page, the next web page, follow the grants, follow the money, it becomes much clearer where things are all headed. So that's sort of my qualifications for being here. I'm very grateful for Susan and Carolyn and Dora for setting this up. And um, I stand here sort of on the shoulders of a larger national group of people. Um, a lot of this work is being done collaboratively. And I would just like to, to say that it's being done across political spectrums. Um, I come from a, a more progressive stance, but this is not an exclusive, this is not a political issue. This is something that is affecting everyone and people from across the spectrum are engaged in this issue. Um, we do have a, a private Facebook group that's been working on this nationally. We have about a thousand members. I would say about a hundred people or so are very active in sharing information. And there's definitely a playlist of how this plays out. So being able to share across state boundaries is really important. Um, so future ready schools. All right, okay. So this was the rabbit hole I fell down. At one point, Emily had a blog and she said, um, you know, only click this link if you're ready to go down the rabbit hole, and, and I did. So this is Global Education Futures Forum, and they, they, they have plotted out um, education through 2035. And um, if, you, if you sign in on the sign-in list, I'll send everybody a copy of this PowerPoint, and there are links. Um, but this is how they envision sort of the future of education. And it's, it's very me-centered, so it's individualized, personalized, and it's sort of this decentralized system of lifelong learning, which we all think is great, right? Like those of us who are in education know that you learn your whole life. I, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't still interested in learning things, but they have a very different version. This is a version that connects with sort of the quantified self, like you as your data that you generate and reputation management and education as sort of lifelong career-based skill building. Now, if you look at that, there really isn't school. Um, there's not really teachers. You have mentors. Um, there's lots of devices and big data and sort of gathering data and in terms of leveraging them for sort of future opportunities. So when I send this around, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, that's sort of the starting point there. Um, 
how I see this end game. Now, I will say I don't know for sure that this will all happen. Like many companies, like make projections and spend lots of money, and things don't actually turn out how they anticipate. Um, but I, I'm here to sort of raise some red flags and talk about patterns and paint a big picture. So when you see pieces happening in your community, you can fit it in because oftentimes it will sound great. Well, it might sound very progressive. It might sound like a great foil for the terror of high stakes testing that we've lived in, a, a great al alternative that we care about children and, and, and the future of humanity. Um, but if they accomplish what I'm gonna talk about, like this is where things are headed. There will be eliminating local control of education, so putting education largely onto digital platforms that are controlled by corporations, um, automating teaching. Um, right before Christmas, the White House issued a white paper about the future of um, the labor market and AI, artificial intelligence, and what the implications are. So there are like grave concerns within sort of the government and the global corporate sector about what um, automation of many service level jobs could look like in the next 20 years for our kids and grandkids. So, so that is move, that's a force moving forward. Um, creating a system, what I call it's really educational surveillance. So once education becomes a predominantly something that happens through a digital platform, that is something that can be monitored and data polled. Um, ESSA has been very big on like whole child. We're talking about a lot about whole child education and really caring about all aspects of children, which is sounds really good and I, I agree with that in many respects, but building like large large data sets and adding that onto the academics is, is troubling to me. And the idea of profiling children from a very early age and using those profiles to sort of reinforce um, certain pathways and tracks is problematic. Um, the learning eco ecosystem concept that they're talking about essentially is, is the idea of that you don't necessarily have neighborhood schools, that there are these drop-in centers, that a lot of learning takes place in other spaces, and that you check in with someone on your, you know, your data dashboard occasionally. Now, in our district, we just released, um, there was a facilities management report, and we have a $4 billion of deferred maintenance in our school building facilities. And we're, we've been on austerity budgets for years, and, there's, and now we have, um, not very good prospects for any additional funding. So um, the reality is we, we have old school buildings, we have buildings that are gonna need boilers and roofs, um, we have terrible water quality, um, we have things that are really impacting children and educators' um, health impacts in buildings. So, so one day they just might say, we're not gonna have the buildings anymore. Um, this cyber model with community-based learning, the community-based learning piece will relate to project-based learning, which again, sounds great, like we all like good projects, right? But they're building these maker spaces and other things, and so you'll have, have digital. Most parents are not comfortable with a 100% digital version of education. There are some kids for whom it fits, like a very narrow slice of kids, but most, that wouldn't be appealing for most families. So what they'll end up pitching are the projects and the community partnerships. Um, so this is something that's being talked about right now, and those of you who are maybe more technically inclined, this idea of Bitcoin and blockchain and smart contracts and virtual currency and payment systems, the idea of sort of micropayments. Um, there's a lot of discussion now about educational savings accounts. So in the past, we talked about vouchers and we were very concerned about having voucher payments going to private schools um, in public education. With ESAs, you can then have much smaller increments of payments around educational opportunities. So within a learning ecosystem, you could have little bits of money spinning off to online systems, community-based learning, different things. So this is being built right now, not just for education, but like within the larger corporate world, smart contracts and virtual currency. So these are all things sort of moving ahead. So what I'm saying is right now we're dealing with Education Reform 1.0 um, on the left. These are all things that we're very familiar with, vouchers, charters, Teach for America, closures and turnarounds, end of year testing, austerity budgeting, um, non-elected school boards. So these are things, and they're very difficult. And for, for teachers who are maxed out, have all these expectations, there's very little bandwidth to do much more than fight this, right? Like this is in our face all the time. This is the immediate danger. But meanwhile, while this is all happening, this is where they're going next, which is what I call Ed Reform 2.0, and these are all trends in um, education. So 
I, largest among them is the learning ecosystem. Hybrid blended learning will be this transition to having more and more digital in the classroom, less and less time with human teachers. Um, there's lots of development in online gaming um, and pulling data out of gamification of education. Uh, there's a big growth industry in AR and VR simulations, even in, down in K-12, the Google Cardboard. Um, again, collecting data on the whole child, the social emotional learning, uh, earning credit outside of school buildings. So this new dialogue is about eliminating seat time. We don't want the old factory model of education. We're going to eliminate seat time, we d it, which is very ironic to me because in a, in a, a district that's been fighting charters, the, char the reform community was always in this phase talking about we want high quality seats. We want kids in high quality seats, meaning like we want kids in schools that get good test scores. Um, well, this learning ecosystem model, there are no more seats. Like in this ne new version, they don't need seats because they're not interested in paying for buildings. Um, th there's a shift to standards-based grading, so you don't get a typical report card A to F. It's numbers, did you meet a standard, do you have a competency and a skill or not? Um, there's the idea of tying educational learning to competencies and badges. So there are individual units you can go and learn outside of school. It's workforce driven, and again, the ESAs. So most, I would say most, even the most activist educators are not really aware that this is happening, or maybe things are creeping into their classroom, but they're not aware of how it fits in with this larger program. So this is from um, KnowledgeWorks, and it's interesting, KnowledgeWorks is based out of Ohio, and they have a program called Strive, and Strive is their community schools program. So this started out, it was funded through Gates in their small schools program like way back. And they're one of the big pushers behind the learning ecosystem discussion. And so this is what they're saying, like they envision reimagined education. Again, it's hard to imagine how you navigate something like this, right? Like I'm, in our city, it's, you know, it's, it's not right, but we have families who are trying, like, how do we get the, our child in the good school or the right opportunity? And, and then you do, and then you're like, okay, well, maybe we're good for eight years until we have to, to, to run that gauntlet again. Um, in this new ecosystem version, education may be like 20 or 30 different learning opportunities that you're navigating. And I can't imagine that for like really stable families with two people or you know an extended family to support that. I don't know what that looks like for special needs children, for children with uh, families that English isn't their first language. Um, they're saying that school will, will take many forms and sometimes it will be self-organized. Okay. Um, that learners will have uh, learning playlists. So the folks behind this, these are the Netflix folks. These are education as a playlist. Um, re reflecting your desires. Um, and the playlist might, might include public schools, but could also include a wide variety of digitally mediated or place-based learning experiences. So again, the school is less central, the existence of a school. And my challenge is like, I don't see this, there's no money for this to exist in addition to neighborhood public schools, bricks and mortar charter schools, cyber charter schools, public virtual schools, and learning ecosystems. There are simply not enough resources. Like even if you thought the idea of having an ecosystem as a supplement to a neighborhood system would work, there's no money to pay for all of this. It's going to be one or the other, and I don't think that neighborhood schools are gonna, are, are gonna win out in that competition. Um, this is also a KnowledgeWorks document. This is how they see the role of educators in the new workforce. So this is, this is what, what they think teachers will be doing. Um, data stewards, learning pathway designers, uh, pop-up reality producers, micro-credential analysts. So, you know, again, my concern is if this is where they're going and, you know, maybe I'm out of step, maybe we have this broad public discussion and somehow there's consensus that everybody thinks this is a good idea, <laughs> I would be willing to to you know, acknowledge that. But right now, the, the, the people who are driving this vision are the, are the corporations and high level like foundations and philanthropic interests and the nonprofits who are going to be in the ecosystem, not schools. Teachers don't know this is happening. I mean, teachers don't, I mean, raise your hand. Have you guys like heard of learning ecosystem? I mean, people don't know that this is where things are going. And, and I, I think if they did, they would fight it. So this is, you know, are, are we looking at a time when we might not have schools and human teachers? Mostly, like maybe token teachers. And it's kind of hard to imagine. My husband said, they would never get rid of school. Come on, they would never get rid of school. Well, um, the state of Pennsylvania has been in a budget crisis with education for years. And 
like within the past year, um, Erie, Pennsylvania has seriously entertained the idea of not having high school due to financial reasons. We may not have high school. Kids can go online or we'll bus them to a nearby district. And, and so what I say is it won't happen until it happens. And then I don't think we're going to get a lot of lead time once the infrastructure is in place for this fallback. Um, you know, I can see at some point within the next five to 10 year time horizon, continued austerity budgets, continue facility disinvestment, more and more of a teacher shortage, that one day the budget doesn't get passed in June and it comes towards September and it's not resolved and they just say, well, we, we, can't, we can't open schools anymore. And if all of these community relationships and everybody has digital devices in place, they'll just say, well, why don't we do that for now? We'll see how it goes. Um, so automated teaching. Um, I will, I will say a, a lot of my, my journey to sort of have a, a framework for understanding this. Um, Henry Noble is there. He has two brothers who did really amazing work. And at one point, Susan Watson in our national group posted a link to a book. And she said, oh, Classroom Arsenal, this looks very interesting. And I said, oh, it does look very interesting. Well, I, I'm going to order a copy. And I got a copy at $8. It went up, I think, to 80 because we cornered the market on all the used copies. But it was very much about the links to the Defense Department and early um, digital education and human systems engineering. So you know, I think if I had not had a framework to understand that a lot of this I wouldn't have gone down some of the paths I went down. Um, as well as, as David Noble had done a lots of work on automated teaching. And we're really very far down the path. So this is a report, and this is Googleable. Like this is what's so amazing to me. Like I can just pull this up on Google. So this is not anything that I had to do an open records request or um, you know, have any clearance to find. But it's a 400 page report from 2014. It was put out by the US Army Research Lab. And they're working on intelligent tutoring systems. So this is work that has been done for quite a while. But what's really interesting is now, I mean, if you've done these online courses, most people realize they're pretty awful, right? Like you're, you know, if you have to do it for certification or you have to take the course to be able to give the high stakes test and you know, to get this, they're terrible. Well, they know they're terrible. And so now they're, they're building into these systems emotion sensing software to monitor your engagement with the platform and remediate you. So this is the table of contents. Um, chapter one is a little blurry, but it's, it's thoughts on instructional management of affect, engagement, and grit. So they're building grit monitoring into these platforms. Um, chapter seven is adaptive interventions to address students' negative activating and deactivating emotions during learning. So like this is pretty, so, so this is a little overwhelming. Um, chapter six is about personalized content. And just so you know that this, this is specifically linked to school, like K-12 schooling, um, Carnegie Learning, which was an outgrowth of Carnegie Mellon University, um, they have, have developed a math AIA um, program that's supposedly in a bestseller. And I just had to testify against an expansion of this contract in the Philadelphia School District. So it was a middle school math program. So, you know, that's something I don't think people appreciate. Um, that these online systems, this was done by USC um, for the Army Research Lab. And this is, and they're, they're not only teaching math, but managing kids' emotions while they're doing the math programs. So this is kind of where things are headed. And again, it's a little Brave New Worldish, but um, this, and, and, the, and the upper corner, this is um, Alex, and it's out of CMU. They're, they're prototyping this around southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, they say children learn better with peers, and peer-based learning is great. So we're going to have big screens, like supersized screens, and kids can interact in front of these cartoon peers to learn. And, and there was like a culturally relevant component to that, too, somehow. So this is like their version. They're, they're prototyping it. There's a big issue with uh, Reasoning Mind um, in Texas. They have these like genie chatbot interfaces with really young kids. It was a program that was developed in Russia. Like, and parents, kids were getting attached to their chatbot instructors. And it's interesting, like even a year ago, I had a friend who, who teaches in Philadelphia, and the kids are all being put on these systems, particularly in turnaround schools where they need to up the test scores. And he, he said, yeah, these kids are interacting with these online tutors. Some of them are real people. Some of them are just like narrow AI formats. But he's like, that's my job. Like they're already outsourcing like my job to online systems. So, so that, and then this is, this is even more reprehensible in my mind. Um, a friend whose husband teaches in Detroit, um, his, all of his first or second graders were pulled out of the class during the school day. So this is not an after school program, like extra remediation. This is during the school day, pulled away from their teacher to do um, Skype 
online learning literacy programs in the school computer lab with um, corporate volunteers. So they were pulled out of, away from their qualified teacher to do a volunteer, but it wasn't really with a human being. It was through a screen and headphones. And this program, TutorMate, is, is funded, like there are many funders, but several of the bigger funders are Halliburton and Booz Allen Hamilton, so defense contractors. So like, there, this is the direction in terms of minimizing and deprofessionalizing the teaching profession. Um, you'll hear in this new version of education, anytime, anywhere, any path, any place. Like, you can learn anywhere. A lot of this has to do with digitizing education. And I think the standards based of behind the high stakes testing, a lot of that was to get rid of, get rid of a lot of veteran teachers, make people miserable, get rid of like new teachers in the, who would have fought it, like to leave, have them leave early, and then to create a situation where education was defined by very narrow standards. And then once education is turned into a very narrow slivers of things that you collect, and you can demonstrate your competency on, you can digitize it. So, you know, the issue around pushing back against high stakes testing and Common Core, they gave people targets to fight, but ultimately the goal, whether you called it Common Core, whatever you called it, was to create an education system that was little narrow bits of pieces that you c collect, and they're interoperable. So this is sort of learning ecosystem concept. LRS is a learning record store. So like moving forward, and again, this is lifelong learning. So they want you from like preschool up through your human capital days, like cradle to gray is sort of what Strive is after, cradle to gray. Um, building your skill sets and storing all of who you are in that learning record store, the LRS. So LMSs are learning management systems. So that's like Dreambox, Compass Learning, like corporate like learning modules. But and that's where it's been for quite some time, but now with the internet of things and more sens sensor-based, they want to be able, and mobile devices, to pull all of that in. So, you know, they want you to be able to pull in your education from YouTube, um, to like download mentor relationships, to download, you know, for-profit and non-profit information into these systems. And IMS Global, you should look them up. I mean, it's the number of partners that they have, and again, it's not just K-12, It's universities, community colleges, everything, they're in charge of making everything interoperable. So that as long as you're bought into the system and the data tagging system, you can be plugged into the anytime, anywhere learning, you d so you don't need schools. Um, so that learning ecosystem with like the kids and you know by themselves isn't going to probably, I mean, it's not going to happen in two years, right? It's, it's the longer time horizon. I see hybrid blended learning as this intermediary phase, and we're really on the threshold of moving into this, some places more than others. Like the one-to-one -one device initiatives, um, the idea of creating digital learning spaces within neighborhood schools and making that normal. So a lot of that's going to be driven by finance, by teacher shortages, by other things, but spending money on devices, not spending money on people. Uh, this was a report that was done last year. It's an industry publication. It was promoting best practices. Our chief academic officer was involved. There were like 20 other high level district representatives from all over the country saying like, these are best practices for hybrid learning. And what I'm trying to say in terms of the context of the charter fight, and what's really interesting, hybrid learning is going to be charterizing our schools from within. And I wrote a blog post. Um, I, I, I work in a garden. And um, in the high summer, we have um, what's called cicada killers. I don't know if any of you have heard of cicada killers. But they're, they're one of the largest wasps. And they catch cicadas, and they, they paralyze them and drag them underground into a burrow, and they incubate their eggs. on the, on the And the, the cicadas aren't dead yet. But you know, like it's, that's, and I really think that the hybrid learning is the charterizing our schools from within. Like we're, we're inviting this in, they've got us, we're sort of zombified because people's resources are stretched and unable to function in many ways. And then ultimately, the digital learning, we will have brought it into our schools and, and it will be the end game. So um, what's also very interesting about this is within the past week, we found some information called, about a program called Education Reimagined, uh, which was a collaboration across many different interest areas um, from the digital learning proponents, including the national leadership of both the um, American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, um, collaborating on this new vision of education reimagined, personalized education. Um, and uh, Becky uh, Pringle, from, who's the vice president of the NEA, attended the closing keynote of the INACAL National Conference. INACAL is the International Association of K-12 Online Learning 
which has been pushing most of this, and um, with Giselle Huff, who got the Lifetime Achievement Award from Ina Cole, and they were best buddies, and they shared this keynote together and said how great it was to collaborate together on this new version of education. Um, so, you know, people know, but I don't think the broad membership of the unions and the parents know exactly what's going on with hybrid learning. Um, Giselle Huff said, we thought that the charters were going to take on hybrid learning. That's what we really thought. She wrote a blog post say, outlining exactly how she and the Broads had funded all of this. And um, she said, we thought the charters were going to pick up and be the blended learning thing. But you know what? They were kind of under siege, and they didn't pick it up fast enough. So we went to Rhode Island. And we figured that we could get it into neighborhood districts in Rhode Island. So we, we started in Rhode Island, and then we, we underwrote pilots in Arizona, which is a huge base of um, cyber charters, and Oakland. Uh, so that's, and this, so this is from the Making Blended Work. They'll say it's tech, like they want kids to know tech. Ultimately, it's a very Tayloristic approach. This is from, from the report. This Cabarrus County is in North Carolina. And this is the end game. They said, you know, starting in 2014, the district, Cabarrus County, identified its best high school and middle school teachers. They doubled the amount of students those educators teach. They cut the in-person time in half and paid the teachers more to reach more kids and get the same results, which is test results, really. And, and so what are the kids doing on the other half of time when they're not with their teacher, right? Well, they're, they're on online platforms. So they're in online platforms. Like they're in, it's, it's, they call it a rotation model uh, oftentimes. So it'll be like they're a third of the time they're by themselves with a the computer and a third of the time they're with peers with a device. And then a third of the time they're having really high quality time with a small group of students with the teacher. But like, so the teacher maybe has 10 kids and your, your child gets 15 minutes of FaceTime with the teacher during that cycle. Um, but this is their model. Like this is what they're saying is their best practice. And there's something that's really scary called opportunity culture, which Cabarrus County is part of, and it's also Gates funded. And they say you don't even actually have to have a real teacher. You can do it remotely if you don't have properly qualified teachers in your district. Um, so, so, so this is <laughs> yeah. This is John Kroll. John Kroll is the new um, chief information officer for the Seattle Public Schools. And it's just important to know. So one of the the pilots that Ina Kroll funded and Giselle uh, Huff and the Hume Foundation funded was in Oakland. So Kroll came from Oakland. So they were sort of at the cutting edge of this hybrid learning approach. Um, and he's also very much connected to IMS Global. Uh, so, you know, he's tweeted about them. There's some other connections. So what they're pitching, and this is interesting, and I'm interested to see where this goes, um, OER is open education resources. And they're free. They're free. Everything is, like, free. So, um, so Washington is a go open state. There are a number of states that are part of this go open initiative. And the, the open education resources are all standards aligned. So this idea of a playlist for children is our students, you know, you, you come up with learning objects and you queue them up based on the personalized pathway. So the data dashboard tells you what the areas the kids need to work on. You line everybody up on their playlist with the data dashboards and then you go about and work with your, you know, 10 kids at a time for 15 minutes. Um, the OER is part of that. And what's really insidious is there are many organizations that we really respect or I had respected that are part of aligning to these OER programs, you know, the Smithsonian and Sesame Street and Discovery Channel and National Geographic, like they're all lined up with these OERs. They want to be the teachers. So in that time when you're not having FaceTime um, and, and, and Kroll, who is right, who is local, is, is sort of part of the shift. The other piece is they talk about free. So I don't know exactly how this will work with the corporate um, like the Dream Boxes, um, Dream Boxes, Reed Hastings of Netflix is behind Dream Box, so the playlist education. Are they going to have both? Are they going to pay for some subscription ones and have free ones? Is one going to supplant the other? I'm not exactly sure. Um, the other piece on the charters, and this is the part of the Pearson conversation that I don't think most people are appreciating. Pearson is very much behind AI and automated teaching. And they actually own Connections Academy, which is a cyber charter operating in 29 states. I don't think people realize that Pearson is in the cyber charter business. Um, how great for them if they get automated teaching like from a business model and can like spew it out to all of these states to have automated virtual schooling. Um, so, so they actually had advocated to the US Department of Education to create a DARPA, ARPA ed to push AI development for education, because they think that's where this is going. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rocket Ship Academy, but this Clever is part of pulling all of this data together in one place, because to have like 
data mined education, you need to be able to look at it all at once. Um, there are hundreds, these are just some screenshots of the apps that are used. There are like several hundred different apps and they all feed into Clever, through the Clever system into one space. And what's really sad, they, there's a, a video that's linked to this for Rocket Ship Academy in, in San Francisco, one of their schools. They have really young kids who, who don't know letters or numbers to log into their apps to learn their letters and numbers that they have the badges with the little code so they're holding up the their their badge in front of the camera to log in for these and and these are little kids <laughs> so i just i find this really reprehensible that this is the model of what these young children are getting so i don't know if any of you guys have heard of little sis little sis is kind of a version of muckety it's sort of a crowdsourcing program so you can um, go online and and build relationship maps of money and people so that's what I've been working on some, is like following the money. Um, the Foundation Center directory online is a great resource, often in your public library, um, which might be part of the learning ecosystem if we don't watch out. But while you're at it, you know, check it out. It's really great. You can follow the money and figure out. So this is how they do it. Um, the learning accelerator was specifically set up to push blended learning. And so what they said is, we're going to do all the stuff that doesn't make sense for a for for-profit people to do. So we're gonna do all the, create all of the infrastructure to allow this to happen. And so they're being funded by like Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which is Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the Hume Foundation with Giselle Hoff that I had mentioned, um, Gates, Carnegie, Hewlett Packard is really big in all of this. So they're throwing their money into the Learning Accelerator. Um, their folks are all connected also with alt certification programs for teachers because they don't really want veteran teachers doing this because they're not going to like it and they're going to be unhappy. They want to bring people up who are like feel the data driven playlist education is the bee's knees. So they're working with the Broad Academy and the New Teacher Project and all of these sort of, you know, they're all connected staff wise. So they're feeding this whole system. So they're, they're paying for the broadband access and the E-rate programs. And again, it's framed as digital divide, right? And it's kind of hard to be against digital access, except if you don't appreciate this model of education, but they're paying for the access they're paying for research, the Friday Institute and NC State, so they pay off higher education to create reports that say this is good. Um, they pay for the open education resources programs. They pay for the platforms that put the open education resources together into systems. Um, they're paying for professional development to try to train the teachers that aren't the brand new teachers into making sure that they do it. And, and, and also the platforms themselves, also Power My Learning and Computers for Youth are computers in homes. And again, it's that digital, are we against having low income people have computer access in their home? No, but if the idea is that once they all have a Chromebook, we don't need a school, yes, I have a problem with that. And that's not being spoken of in a broad way. So this is how this money, money sort of gets flows around. And it's very intentional. And part of this is I would think like, oh, you know, again, this could never happen, except there's a lot of forces, like, the people who have a vested interest in seeing this happen are like the most powerful people in the world right now. <laughs> um, this is from uh, a talk from Vincent Mosco about cloud base and big data. And you know, there, there's a designation from August 2016 of the, you know, the largest firms in the world. Um, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook are all invested and have a, have a financial direct fa vested interest in having digital learning, having this type of learning happen. So if we think it can't happen, it be, that these are just some crackpot people, these are not just crackpot people. There are really great forces that are pushing this. Um, so these are the various interest groups. I mean, there are others, again, behind personalized pathways. And I'm going to be speaking about the Department of Defense Origins, the tech industry, the research inst universities are all behind this. Uh, telecommunications, uh, Comcast is one of the major industries in Philadelphia. They're building a second huge skyscraper, the tallest building in the city. And I, as I, like every time I walk by it, I keep thinking, they're building that because they're going to know, they're going to run our education system through that building. Like they're building it on projections of where this is all going. And healthcare, like not just education, big data. Data, but our education is a big piece of that. And so Comcast, they don't pay, they're, you know, they're, they're, they've been very much supportive of privatization and cutting education funding, but they stand to, to telecommunications. Um, the foundations, and it's not just Gates. So I'm here, and I did visit the Gates Visitor Center yesterday. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's not, and he gives cover for a lot of folks. So it's the INACOL, it's the Carnegie Foundation, it's the Ford Foundation, it's Hewlett Packard, it's many, many foundations that are behind this. And then the cultural institutions. So again, who's going to be offering the badges 
um, it's it's the museums and the libraries and the maker spaces so you know they're going to get grants and they're going to hire nice people to run their programs but probably without benefits or like full-time employment and so they're in that system right and this is all aligned to the workforce so again chamber of commerce all behind that and the other piece for this is pay for success which is part of the essa and i don't think it's on most folks time horizons but pay for success in 2013 the harvard business review said pay for uh, social impact bonds are going to be the new venture capital so when the harvard business review says that like you should pay attention right so um essentially what pay for success is is what you say well the public isn't going to pay for public programs we're not going to have tax funded public programs anymore. The private sector is going to do this. And we'll have the private sector invest with the idea that we make this investment and we'll offset some future cost. And then we'll pay them the money back on the money we save and plus a little bit. And so there's like a deal, you set a deal and then there's deal, there's third party assessors of the deal. Right now it's being used in early childhood, which is was happened in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, Goldman Sachs was the investor. Uh, there's uh, some deals in Chicago around early childhood and also recidivism. But my sense is, is that the learning ecosystem will be built on pay for success. So they'll destroy education and they will rebuild it in this new version and they will make their money off of these impact investments. So it started in the UK, but New Profit is based out of Boston. Um, and they're facilitating a lot of this. They have a whole program called, you know, like the Reimagine Education Fund, and they're funding all of these things. Again, uh, blended learning, new classroom innovations, KIPP, new teacher center. They're funding all of these. It turns out Gates pretty much funding all of them as well. So, so there's a financial, the financial industry is part of this. And you know, I'm here today. I'm not. A, I'm not someone who's told. I mean, I'm not. I. I, I think that there's a place for technology. Um, but I think as we look at how technology happens in our classrooms, we need to think about the power behind the technology and whose interests are represented. So thinking about who, who is creating me, like you know, who has created them, whose interests are they serving, like a playlist education? Um, are these free tools, is this something that's just going to continue to allow small numbers of people to maintain power? And, and are, are they giving us freedom or subjugation? I mean, and I think those are the things I mean, I have very strong feelings about where I think the ecosystem is headed. Um, but we need technology that empowers people to create and share their vision of the world and to connect with one another in a human way. We don't need technology that learns children and tracks them. So, okay. So again, this is workforce lifelong learning. I'm gonna play this video. It's, it seems really corny. Um, the acting, the acting is a little corny, okay? But it's, it's, it's it, it paints the picture before I, I watch, I'm gonna just say, so this is, was created by Institute for the Future. Institute for the Future dates back to the 60s. It was a spinoff of RAND, okay? So this is a partial list from their website of their partners of Institute for the Future. I mean, it's everyone from AARP to the Navy um, and, and, you know, major multinational businesses. KnowledgeWorks is right here. So KnowledgeWorks is the whole learning ecosystem, those slides from the very beginning. So um, that tells you something, even though it's, it's hokey. Um. Your ledger account tracks everything you've ever learned in units called EduBlocks. Each EduBlock represents one hour of learning in a particular subject. Anyone can grant EduBlocks to anyone else. You can earn EduBlocks from a formal institution like a school or your workplace. But you can also earn them from individuals or informal groups like a community center or an app. The ledger makes it possible for you to get credit for learning that happens anywhere, even when you're just doing the things you love. Your profile displays all the EduBlocks you've earned. Employers can use this information to offer you a job or a gig that matches your skills. We'll keep track of all the income your skills generate and use that data to provide feedback on your courses. When choosing a subject to study in the future, you may wish to choose the subject whose students are earning the most income. You can also use the ledger to find investors in your education. Since the ledger is already tracking income earned from each EduBlock, 
You can offer investors a percentage of your future income in exchange for free learning hours. Our smart contracts make these agreements easy to manage and administer. The ledger is built on blockchain, the same technology that powers Bitcoin and other digital currencies. That means every edu block that has ever been earned is a permanent part of the growing public record of our collective learning and working. Always learning, always earning. That's my motto. I try to learn something new every month, but it ain't easy. I'm a freelance delivery driver, so my schedule isn't steady. One thing that helps, I love to read. So I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I'm driving. Memoirs, history, philosophy. Oh, and I got that app that gives you blocks whenever you finish a book. I'm part of a learning group, a bunch of other drivers I met on a forum. We all take turns teaching the group. Sometimes we add blocks to our profiles, but it isn't really about that. It's more like Ledger has opened up people's eyes to the fact that teachers are everywhere. I started teaching last summer right after the federal government announced the Pay It Forward program. You know about that, right? If you have federal student loans from college, you can pay them down by teaching someone else what you learned. Whatever blocks you earned in school, you can teach them to others. The University of Texas, that's where I did my degree, they report all my college credits directly into the ledger, so I'm pre-approved to teach any subject I passed. Like virtual reality programming. If I can teach someone that course, I get $2,500 off my debt. I use the same textbook that I used in college, and I Skype with them three times a week to answer questions and help them with their coding assignments. Sooner or later, most people find themselves at a point in their learning where they need to make a decision. Do you go for the traditional college degree or build your own higher education? That's the kind of tough choice that a lot of young people are facing right now. Yes, I won! This is Texas Fold'em. It's one of those protein folding simulators where you learn how proteins work inside the human body. And you can help solve puzzles for science. Every time you solve a puzzle, you earn this biochemistry edu block. And the better you get at it, the harder the puzzles get. Well. I guess I got pretty good at protein folding, because one day, this trophy showed up, and they started giving me super hard puzzles working on these mind-blowing structures that even the real scientists haven't figured out yet. But wait a minute. I'm one of the real scientists now, actually, because I'm not just earning edu blocks now, they're also paying me for every puzzle I solve. This game is sort of like my first class in biochemistry, and it's also my first job. We used to have this concept of entry-level jobs. You would start with a company, and then you could move your way up. That's how I started here. We hardly have any full-time jobs here. We mostly hire on a project basis. We check their ledgers, and if their credentials match our needs, then we'll put them in the hiring pool. Of course, relationships are still important, and we still help people grow. They're earning edge blocks with every hour of work they put in. Why give someone a generic test when you can actually evaluate their work in a real-world context? When you log into a verification site, it gives you a task, a chance to demonstrate your proficiency in a real-world context. You can write some copy, translate some text, design a logo, grade an essay. This is actually how most pay-it-forward verification works these days and pretty much any credentialing that you do on informal learning. You're even paid for your time. Not the going rate, more like minimum wage. When did anyone ever get paid for taking a final exam? Every project we hire for, we don't just list the monetary compensation. We also list exactly how many edu blocks in which skill areas will grant you. That way, your work here counts as learning for your next gig. When it's my turn to teach, I take it really seriously. 
because for me, learning has always been the one thing that's connected everything else in my life. Where I've been, where I'm going. I may not know where that is yet, but I know I won't be a driver forever. And when I get there, I know I'll still be learning. Yeah, you can just, you can get it online. So again, it sounds hokey, but um, there's aspects of this. The direct talent investment is part of the Global Education Futures timeline. There's a, a supplementary video with a young woman who's like in a cafe and she's deciding what new course to take. And she can do Mandarin, which she can self-finance, but virtual reality programming pays more, but she would have to get someone to, to pay, help pay her tuition, but then they would garnish her wages going forward. And it, it's really fascinating because right now, Purdue actually has a program in place called Back a Boiler, which is exactly this private investment in tuition for future garnished wages and they have sample contracts. And so like, there are aspects of this that are already uh, sort of moving forward. Uh, so wait a minute. So again, um, I just keep going back to the humanity. Like, <laughs> I think we have to hold on to the fact, it seems crazy to think that moving forward in this new version of education to advocate for the right of children to learn with human teachers with other human children face to face. But I think moving forward, that's, that's where we're headed and protecting children's data. I think the new version of where things are going to be going is you'll hear them talk about which are the good programs. These are high quality programs. So that's what Common Sense Media is being set up to right now to be the gatekeeper of. Here's a bazillion programs. We'll tell you which the good ones are. A lot of these organizations are recognizing the student privacy issues and they're trying to get ahead by saying we're going to be protecting student data and privacy. But I think all of us who understand cloud-based computing realize once you start building these data sets, there are just no guarantees that, that any of it will stay safe. And and it's one thing as adults to make decisions about how you use online resources for yourself as an adult, but we're putting really, really young children and their whole future is, is riding on this data that we're collecting. Um, so again, this is, this is another, it connects to link, uh, human capital management. It's called Red Critter. My friend Sherry Kissaker uh, found this. She finds all the good stuff. Um, this is a, a program that's really fascinating. If you look it up, there's two interfaces, and one is the teacher interface, and it's sort of this behaviorist, um, beha classroom behavior management, token economy. The kids wear wristbands, and the teachers can zing points and currency to kids for proper behavior. Exactly. Um, I tried to tweet this to Alfie Cohn because he gave a talk on badges to some badging conference once, and I'm like, look, it's going really wrong. It's already <laughs> going really wrong. Um, there's another interface that's like very much linked to like LinkedIn, uh, your it's hipster against a like brick wall. Like so there's you you get acclimated to this and then you continue your badge skill building. It's a corporate module. So it has two very different visuals, like the gamified avatar for kids and the sort of slick. Um, and you know, I, I gave a version of this talk talking about like sort of personalized learning in Orwellian times, but I think as these Chromebooks are coming into our, our, our schools, I don't think people are realizing the extent to which as we're connecting with them and, and getting information off the devices that they're pulling information from us and how we use them. Um, you know, I, I have a Band-Aid on my camera. Um, I gave a talk in New York uh, with like a whole bank of, you know, apps. Apple monitors, and you know, I'm just like, hi, you know, um, they're they're watching us too, and um, so this is a quote from Orwell about telescreens, and I'll just read it. Um, it was a terribly dangerous, it was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within range of a telescreen. The smallest thing could give you away: a nervous tick, an unconscious look of anxiety, a habit of muttering to yourself, anything that carried with it the suggestion of abnormality, of having something to hide. There's even a word for it in Newspeak. Face crime, it was called. The party surveillance ta tactics and technology are so advanced that even the smallest twitch can betray a rebellious spirit. So I think really like these things, there are tools and we can use these, but we have to realize that, that there are other elements to this. This is um, Affectiva. It was a program developed with MIT to help kids on the spectrum with social cues, but it's a motion uh, sensing facial recognition software. So they're also using it for branding and they'll play videos of people interacting with brands and then evaluate the motions based on the video footage. Um, it's also overlaid on top of surveillance cameras. 
uh, for crowd groups and identifying people who may be up to something in, in public settings. But it is actually being used to monitor engagement of online with online learning platforms. So, you know, a lot of this seems very Brave New World, like it couldn't, but it, the technology exists, and it's just a matter of like how quickly it gets integrated into the digital platforms. Um, just a bit of background. Um, I, I tried to build sort of a timeline of technology and sort of different developments, and it's interesting how much of this really centers around like the early to mid 90s. Um, in uh, Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 13111, um, and that essentially set up a program called Advanced Distributed Learning. And it was the e-learning program initially for Department of Defense. And it made sense, like if you have someone who's in a naval submarine in the South Pacific and they need instruction on a new operating system, they're not going to trek back to Norfolk for an in-person class, right? So, so that made sense. Um, but the way it was written, it was intended not just for Department of Defense and, or federal employees broadly, but to essentially partner with um, the private sector and higher education to develop high quality instructional software and wire deployment uh, so that all Americans can take advantage of learning technology. So a lot of what we're seeing happening within e-learning is linked to this creation of ADL as these collabs to facilitate public, private, and higher education partnerships to develop e-learning. And then it, it really took a big jump once the cloud-based computing started. Um, this is, you know, the ADL logo. Um, they're also international. They have international outposts. Um, but again, it's it's in in depth learning management, and also they call it like just in time training. You know, it, it applies to workforce. You just train yourself as you go along. They have four collabs. Um, the administrative one is in Alexandria. Uh, there's a military one in Orlando. The workforce based one is in Memphis, and the academic one is in Madison. And it's really interesting. The one in Madison does all sorts of stuff with, with online gaming, gaming and education. And they partner very closely, ironically, with the Florida Virtual School, which is the incubator for much of this in K 12 online learning. So the Florida Virtual School incubates it in connection with um, ADL uh, Madison. And Western Governors University is, is the higher ed version. And these are all the, the focus areas of ADL so e learning, mobile learning, learning analytics. Um, learning theory, learning architecture, and web-based virtual worlds. So this is actually really big in Department of Defense aspects is learning through simulation, which again, I can understand within uh, you know, a defense context, you're training folks in, in certain scenarios, you'd like to be able to role play those over and over again with different outcomes. But much of the stuff that gets incubated here then launches out into the rest of the world um, in, into education. Um, the other thing is we're moving now into Internet of Things. So that's, this is the next version of where things are going with computing is like real-time data, uh, sensors embedded in many aspects of the environment, um, and you know, including mobile devices. ADL developed something called SCORM, which is the Shareable Content Object Reference Model. And so that's the stuff that worked with like the Dreambox in a, in a very traditional setting. Like you learn something and then it feeds your data back into the system to, to monitor it. Um, but it didn't work with phones. It didn't work with... Um, you know, tracking other things. So then they developed what's called um, Tin Can API or X API. Um, and that was to, to, to document learning happening everywhere. So it's, 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 it's the system by which all of that data will feed into your learning record store. And again, this is being picked up in human resource management. So it's actually much more advanced in HR divisions um, than education. So. Um, and again, these are just some, as we're talking about building these data sets, um, important to keep in mind, like data isn't neutral. I think a lot of folks like to pretend that data is data. Um, but, but data is political. Um, data is a product. It, it has value. Um, we're mining our kids' data. Essentially, you know, in my mind, some of these smart classrooms, these one-to-one -one device classrooms, are factories of data is what we're doing to children. Um, they can be used to, to maintain power imbalances and modify behavior. And increasingly under ESSA, there's going to be much more data collected. Um, and there, there's a book, um, Kathy O'Neill has a book called uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. She was a quant and looking at the implications of algorithmic decision making and social justice um, going forward because these algorithms are, are what's shaping our kids' education. Um, lots of data. Again, I, I, Fitbits are showing up. Um, we have something called scholarship because I guess they didn't trust teachers to take attendance anymore. So you, know, you have your badges with your face, you know, all the kids have their digital pictures and they, they sign in, but those RFID chips are all there. And I'm not saying it's all nefarious, but we have to acknowledge that there's data attached to all of that that's 
being built in. Um, classroom management software, Classroom Dojo. Like there, there's, Google has something called Classcraft now that's like gamified and, and it's behavior management, but like it's team-based. So you can have like teams of kids and they can decide to help their friends or not. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of, and again, this is the whole child conversation, which is really so hard to have because a lot of this is they're framing it within language that we really, like we feel we own and they're restructuring it in a different end and they're the ones with the power to take it in a new direction more so than we are so building in like tracking the trauma aspect tracking family data breaking down silos within the community school context that worries me i mean i think that there are some reasons that that data shouldn't all be aggregated in one space um this is just from red critter like they're building behavioral maps so this is really kind of Freaky, you know, they, the data gets built up. So this is, um, you know, you look at this, this child is very gritty, but not very coachable. Like, I mean, this is the reality of where they think this data, that these, you know, visualizations of data can <coughs> impact how you interact with children. And, and how, what does that look like when you get that in second grade? And like, where does that, does that place you? Are you going to, would you be at the same place in sixth grade if this didn't exist? <laughs> um, I think these are questions we need to be asking. Uh, this, Sherry gave me this one too. This is a module that's rolling out in Colorado. Again, we don't, we have, um, we don't have enough counselors. We don't have school social workers, but now we're gonna have online modules to teach kids empathy and impulsive decision making. Um, and have them work through the modules. And what's really crazy about this, what their, their selling point is that they can record deleted text. So they're like, well, kids don't wanna talk to us. Um, they would rather type stuff on a computer. So we're gonna put them through these modules about like, proper behavior and then even if they delete stuff overwrite it like we can still know what they said which is crazy right um again gamification you know here they're saying it's innocent it's fun kids like it right like hey you know but they're saying besides being efficient and engaging virtual environments also collect a lot of behavior data which can be used with education data mining techniques and again they're, they're what they're looking at is not just academic but things like life skills leadership um, building some more of the data sets. Um, and you know, people knew this was going to be a problem even back in 2003. So this is like sort of pre everybody having a smartphone. PLAs, personal learning assistants. So this is like what we're ending up with these tablets and Chromebooks. What are the implications for privacy data security if these things can be queried at any time? And you know, we need to be thinking about that. And right now, what I'm saying is people aren't thinking about it enough. Um, so what I said in sort of my origin story of getting into this next phase of education reform had to do with the Dell Foundation. And I was really angry that they would disrupt our educational system and then say, now we're going to put in report cards to grade your schools. Um, and at the time, I thought, well, they had just donated a bunch of computers to one of the like magnet schools. And I thought it was about selling computers. Like, that's really what I thought. And then uh, like uh, over the summer, I, I saw Snowden, which, which I highly recommend. But um, also Citizen Four is actually a pretty amazing historical document, Laurie Poitras. But in, in the film, he's like throwing down, someone says, well, how do I know that you're legit? And he starts throwing down his IDs. And one of them, he's like, here's my Dell ID. And I'm like, Dell ID? Dell ID? Well, it turns out that the NSA is one of Dell's major clients. And much of the information that Snowden pulled, he pulled as a contract employee from Dell. So I think it's not just about selling computers. It really, there is a surveillance component. Um, this is a shorter one. This is their pitchy, their pitch for Our world today is filled with countless choices. Now more than ever, we can personalize how we shop, eat, socialize, and consume media, just to name a few. Now, imagine a learning system that reflects this new era of choice, that places students in the driver's seat of their own educational journey. This has long been a goal of education, but now it's totally possible. At Dell, we believe a student-centered learning environment delivers better outcomes because education is tailored toward the individual student's passions, pace, and learning style. Students can apply a range of tools to show mastery of learning through an ongoing process of research and open communication. Students will create a more connected and meaningful learning experience if given a seat at the table to craft the time, place, path, and pace of their education. The role of the teacher elevates to that of a co-creator or designer of learning, which allows them to spend more time working with students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. 
technology's role in this model is to support student-centered activities with flexible knowledge sharing tools and processes. Working with educators, Dell is creating a learning environment that amplifies the student's voice and empowers students to invest in the learning process. Together, we can develop the next generation of student voice and choice driven education. Learn more at dell.com slash k12. I'm sure they're very disinterested in all this. So, but again, any they get to choose the path and the pace and make it student voice and choice. But you notice there's a road. There's just one road. Mm -hmm. They could go fast on that road or slow on that road, but really it's just one road. So, you know. Um, this is interesting. Uh, Phil, the uh, Democratic National Con Convention was in Philadelphia last summer, and I have a friend, and she said the Atlantic Magazine hosted a bunch of uh, talks. She said, Allison, you have to come to this talk. It's about like education and the creative economy. Um, and so she and I went, and it was, a, it was an interesting talk. It was sponsored by Epic Games. And Epic Games envisions a big role for gaming in the future of education. Um, we, we went, it's interesting, so the, the folks here, this is Suzanne Delbene from Washington State. So she founded the Internet of Things Caucus in Congress. Um, this is a city council person. Um, this is the head of Epic Games. Epic Games is based in the Research Triangle, Raleigh-Durham area. This is a woman, she's now in California, but she, at the time she was just wrapping up at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison working closely with the ADL CoLab on gaming. And this was the facilitator. So. So, so this was happening, they're all about games and education. Um, what's interesting is that this gentleman here, um, his company was, was bought out a couple years, 40% of his company was bought out by Tencent. So Tencent and Alibaba are the two main drivers behind Sesame Credit in China. I don't know, are any of you guys familiar with the Sesame Credit concept? So Sesame Credit is currently voluntary. My understanding is supposed to roll out in a couple years to be required. It is a sort of personal rating system based on your good citizenship. And, and it's not just you, but also the people in your social network. So I don't know if any of you watch Black Mirror. There's a thing, like there's an episode called Nosedive. If you haven't seen it, I would look it up. Like I was explaining to people and I hadn't watched it and they're like, that's that Black Mirror episode. So essentially they are building like d data sets around who you are and who you connect with and how you are in the world according to outside determinations of what good citizenship represents. Um, so again, you think, oh, well, that's China. And again, this is from the New Yorker. Like, this is really happening. It's not made up. There's a really nice video about it, like, uh, that explains it. Um, and that seems like, oh, well, that's China, right? Like, that's so far away. But China is invested in, in this guy's gaming company, and they're really set up and very interested in spend, having your kids spend a lot of time on online games in the classroom. Um, Again, we need to educate folks. We need to educate parents like about all of this data, what's being collected, when. You know, my concern is that data is going to be built not to open opportunities, but really to limit people's opportunities. And moving forward, given the labor market and the idea that access to living wage jobs is going to be severely constrained if we don't come up with a better plan, the idea of sidelining children at very young ages based on their behavior, or their academic performance in these systems is really is really concerning um, and it's not just about individual data for children so this is the other thing there's metadata so all of these open education records um, they have tags um, they know how they move throughout space how they're used how they're stored when they're pulled you know if you have a blog you, you know you can pull all that information up like you know in individual data points the metadata is just as important as the personally identifiable data and this is what's called the learning registry Maybe you guys have ever heard of the learning registry so it's a program of the Department of Defense and the Department of Education and they're all about this OER stuff right and so they're saying we're going to have these are the the OER resources here's your stuff it's all tagged you know, the Smithsonian's working, everybody's working really hard to tag everything. Again, it's not about whether it's Common Core. Like, they could change the tags and the names, but they're tagging everything. Then these are the companies that are going to sell, the, like, match the tags. Like, here's the metadata, here's the tag. The apps are going to pull the tags in and send them into the classrooms. But in this interface, this data is flowing, like, all the tags and how it's being used in the classroom. So, you know, a lot of, you know, there was a discussion of close the door and teach. Well, how do you close the door and teach if you're forced to have much of your instruction happen through smart boards and they're watching what you put on your smart board and how long it's there? Um, so there are these emitters that can be put on the smart boards and increasingly they're having them synced to kids and having tablets and Chromebooks so they'll know, is this an open education re record, uh, resource? How often was it used? Who used it? Which grade? How, how experienced was the teacher? Um, was this a teacher in you know, a low-income district, 
what is you know who were the kids in that room how long did they use it and and there are just there's all of this data potential that again like I are they going to come in and say you're not teaching you know your social studies allotment as you you know we've been watching how you've been using your resources and you're not doing it right like the, the level of micromanagement and monitoring is is really concerning so that technology is sort of in place um, so the other piece beyond the digital and this is re really important which is not on most people's radar is the credit flexibility so you know when you have a bunch of snow days and they're like oh we're gonna have to make those up because we have to by state require a certain number of kids in schools for a certain number of days they're trying to break all that down because how does a learning ecosystem work if you have to go to school right so they're working on the credit flexibility piece and out of school time learning and a lot of the out of school time learning conversation is starting out as opportunity gaps and summer programs and after school programs which are perfectly legitimate and yes I, I appreciate that those exist and that those are important but in building this learning ecosystem infrastructure, I think it's going to be built within the framework of these out of school time opportunities until they become needed to be pulled into B school. Um, and the idea of associating badges um, with things that you do in out of school time learning. So in Ohio, they have this credit flexibility legislation um, essentially that says like, there, you can just say you're going to do something and it, it's tied to a competency and do it in a community-based program like a summer improv program and get school credit for it and they're pitching this and this is a really hokey website but uh, you know, I'll pull up the state credentials they call it hackable high school so it's, it's pulling it's like the Pokemon Go like go out into the world and collect things and eventually you'll have enough to move on to your workforce you know placement um, you know it's game-based learning it's blended learning it's the, the OER that I'm talking about and I can't remember, competency-based. So this is like, you'll hear competency-based education, proficiency-based education. It, it doesn't have to be labeled that to be moving in that direction, but it, th this is, so this is Ohio. And ELO, so these are called ELOs, and sometimes the E is extended, enriched, or enhanced learning opportunities. Again, New Hampshire is in the lead. A lot of this is coming through New England right now um, and hitting into Massachusetts. So if you know any folks in Massachusetts, I really would love for them to like step it up a little bit against the digital learning. Um, so ELOs, um, in addition to being things like service learning or travel or school-based enterprises, I think in, in, in New Hampshire, you can, you can help out at the school, I, the district IT department and get school credit. Um, it can include virtual learning. So what they're not saying about ELOs is that actually a lot of it is also digital learning. Um, and again, there's part of me, could one or two of those be okay? Yeah, like I think one or two could be okay. But this is from Grade Schools Partnership. They're pushing what this is happening in New England and they're saying, well, it could be elective credit. Okay, one or two, like with limits. Core credit, eh, you know, competency recovery. Well, I can see, again, kids that need to catch up, like certain circumstances, this could work. But the, the bottom line is no restriction. And that's kind of what Ohio has, is that like there really isn't any limit. So Alec has been working over the last year to get all of their stuff updated with their online digital education work, um, online learning clearing houses, digital learning plans, like they're getting everything set up for the digital stuff. And this is a PowerPoint from the, the Ohio Department of Education on this legislation. Um, so they're saying that the examples could be distance learning, so again, not you know, online learning, after school, travel, independent studies. I mean, what does that look like in terms of equity? Like, oh, you can, you know, go and, you know, you're going to Europe, fine, we'll grant you like three course works of, you know, school credit for that. What does that look like for other kids? Oh, well, you have to work until 11 at night at a corner store to get your credit. Like, it's, it's, there's a lot of child labor concerns I have around this. Um, this is from some questions. Can districts charge students a fee for a district teacher's time to review the plans, tests, and related activities. So there's a lot of paperwork, right? You're gonna outsource this, there's a ton of paperwork. No, generally can't. So there's no money for this. So they're saying the schools, you have to handle all of the administrative process, but there's no money to it. Um, this is what they're requiring of their local districts, that the credits have to count for, for graduation, you can't limit them, and you can allow simultaneous credits. You can like double dip. You can like have a whole bunch of these. You can take one class and like if you can show it matches to a bunch of competencies, you, you can do that. So wh what would keep a kid from doing that? Um, and then this is like, what is the funding impact if a student isn't enrolled in attending? Well, generally said there's only money if the kid is in your building. This is crazy. Like, I don't know why people in Ohio like aren't up in arms over, I, I think it's quiet. Like, I think right now it hasn't fully developed and the infrastructure is there to have this happen, but it hasn't fully happened yet. But there's nothing, there's no limits on this. Um, 
MacArthur Foundation is a really big pusher of digital media and learning. Um, they're doing a lot with badging. We're, Philadelphia is one of these um, cities of LRNG. I'm assuming it means learning. They're all about the badges. Mozilla is connected with the badges. IMS is connected with the badges. You can go earn badges anywhere. And again, this is framed within, this is a um, summer program, summer and after school, but it's a $25 million seed investment in badging. So they're building all these pieces, they're building all these pieces, and a lot of them sound great. Summer programs, cool summer programs, yes. Maker spaces, yes. Until, again, school, schools are no longer needed. Um, Again, just touching on this, pathways, that's another code word you'll hear a lot. Kids are on these pathways. Um, kids are increasingly being pressured to identify career pathways at very young ages. I'm hearing like sec quizzes in second grade. Um, but in, in, in more specific ways, Naviance is a big issue for us. Um, it's a company that ostensibly tries to match kids with college opportunities suited to their interests, but there are very invasive um, surveys that are associated with that. And in many districts, kids are not allowed to get their diploma until they've completed all the survey information. And it's a third party system. So it's, it's a real problem. Um, this is a very skills-based approach to education. Again, you just acquire skills as you go along. And, and I think people are, students are increasingly isolated from one another. And it's not about learning in relationship. Um, the ELOs, again, I see ELOs as being work-based learning. And again, I'm not against vocational learning or you know, CTE opportunities, but it has to be done with a full understanding of what the consequences are. Um, I think in Ohio, like up to half of a, a, a student's credit could be work-based. And what does that mean for students? I mean, does, is that helping a student who wouldn't otherwise be able to get out, or is that giving a student, you're only paying for half their education? You know, it, it's a question. It's a question I think we need to grapple with. Um, and then also, increasingly, there is pressure to lift restrictions on sharing student records. Um, there's something called the Coalition of Evidence, Committee on Evidence-Based Policymaking, big national hearings on this lately. Um, you know, they're trying to say like, well, we just want kids to know like if they're making a college investment, like which ones, you know, who graduates and what kind of salary they get. But this is, this is highly problematic. And my concern around evidence-based, and not that I'm against evidence, but that it will be increasingly tied to scores and digital numbers, and that it will facilitate this pay for success program. So if we're talking about we want programs that show that there's evidence-based results, it will be test results, and it will be used to, I mean, they're not going to be really looking at authentic portfolios of student work. They just need, they need these dashboards. Um, so I'm wrapping up. This is a picture of Rocket Ship Academy. What I'm trying to say is we need to reframe this conversation. And, and what, what I'm struggling with and what I think we all need to work on is coming up with new language. Because a lot of language that we owned has been taken from us and corrupted in ways. And by continuing to use it, like we're actually reinforcing the end goal of people who have way more power or perceived power than we do at the moment. Um, a lot of this is happening without, it's a grand experiment. It's kind of a grand brain experiment. Like they will tell you a lot of this has to do with like neuroscience and brain science and there's no indication of what the outcomes are gonna be for kids but there's no IRB protocol on this. No one is telling parents, we're, we're going to do a big experiment on your kids for the next five years, I hope you don't mind. Like, or if you do, here's another option you can pursue is to have education with a person and real books. Um, that isn't happening yet. Um, MacArthur Foundation spent half a million dollars to an organization called Frameworks that is specifically set up to frame conversations. And they say, okay, this is where we want to get people to. Let's do a bunch of focus groups and figure out where people are. And then let's like nudge them slowly so that we can get them to where we want them to go. And, and, and they're, I mean, it's very admirable. There's part of me that really admires their planning and focus. They have very long time horizons and they're sticking to their plan and they're really getting, they're making a lot of headway. But the reframing is critical. So these are just some of the ways I've tried to sort of burst the bubble on this. When people are talking about innovative, it's not tested. Student-centered is isolating. That's not what we want for children. Um, these adaptive systems, uh, personalized, it can't be personalized without being data mined. And that's sort of my limit when people are talking about technology. I don't want my child using a program that has to learn them to work properly. I trust the child and the teacher to figure out how to use tools on a day-to-day -day basis of how they want to use them. My kids shouldn't have to log in with a particular system in order for it to work. Like in, in Philadelphia, in many districts, our email, student email accounts are tied to, um, they're run by Google, they're Google accounts, they say philasd.org, but they're Google accounts, and their account addre address is their student ID number. And we just have cheap Chromebooks, so as soon as you log in, all of that data is, is followed and managed. Um, 
adaptive, controlled. Just think of that pathway in the Dell video. Those kids can't get off that road. They're on the road that's set for them. Um, the blended learning, don't buy that. That means that you're only getting a teacher a third of the time. And that's, even if you have lots of technology, that's not okay. Um, I, I haven't seen it yet so much, but it is, well, actually, it is the growth of iReady. I don't know if iReady is in, in Washington State and these other embedded assessments and benchmark assessments. Increasingly, I think they will require the benchmarks in lieu of the end of your test. And they will say, oh, it's less stressful for children because it's just ongoing, it's just embedded. They'll never know when they're being tested. And so like we, we feel for the kids who are really under stress at these end of year tests, let us fix it for you. Let us just test them all the time in secret and they'll never know. Um, the gamification is really about behavior modification and that these devices are ways to gather data. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I have a blog, it's called Wrench in the Gears. Um, I'm trying to open these conversations. I don't have the answer. A lot of people are like afterwards like, okay, what is the next step? And I think realistically speaking, like I acknowledge that our former educational system was not serving many children. Like I'm not trying to pull it back and just say, well, we should just do what we did before. I think where we go forward in this new world is something that merits a much broader conversation and a diverse and inclusive conversation for a form of public education that maintains a public communal space and that respects all people as human beings and that equitably funds and supports all children. And so I, by myself, can't have that conversation. And I don't think enough people in the world know all of this to have that conversation yet. So that's why I'm running around trying to have this conversation. And I hope that you guys will share this information. If you have an email account, I am happy to, to forward this slideshow or other slideshows if you want to pick it up and edit it and take it out um, and move move from there so I guess I guess that's it yeah okay. <laughs>